Good morning, everyone. I am getting ready to harvest the last of my sweet corn. So I thought I'd take a moment to share with you all the top lessons that I have learned through the years towards having a fantastic harvest of corn, whether that's sweet corn or popcorn or flower corn, even ornamental corn. Now, I live in Ohio, which admittedly can feel sometimes like the land of corn and growing conditions in many parts of the state are quite favorable towards growing corn. However, there are a few things to keep in mind no matter where you are growing for a really fantastic harvest. Now, some of you savvy gardeners, I'm sure, will know some of the tips already that I am going to share. But I wanted to be sure to cover all the big, important bases for anyone out there who happens to be brand new to growing this garden staple. Tip number one, planting time is important. And it's not just waiting till danger of frost has passed, although that is very important. For many types of corn, you want to wait until that soil has warmed to at least 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Be aware that some types are even more sensitive to cool soil than others. Some varieties have what is described as good cool soil emergence and vigor. And this simply means that those varieties of corn specifically are gonna have a better chance when planted in cool soil, that they're gonna jump up out of the ground rather than sitting in the soil and potentially rotting and put on quick growth. Not all corn will do that. And by cool soil, we're talking right around that 50 degree mark or slightly lower. So if you want to get out there and plant super early but your soil just is not warming up quickly opt for one of those varieties the other option is of course you can warm your soil a little more quickly by covering it with plastic or doing something to retain the heat in that soil now as info here in my ohio garden my last spring frost date is typically right around may 10th I usually don't plant corn of any type until Memorial Day weekend. Some of that's just due to the fact that I'm completely overwhelmed with planting and I can't get it done anymore quickly. But really, even if I have the time, I would probably hold off at least until the 15th, possibly even later, just because I tend to have a little bit better results waiting a little bit later into the month of May. On the other end of the timing spectrum, many types of corn can be planted later into the season. The important thing is to look at your first fall frost date and make sure that you have enough time for your corn to mature prior to that frost hitting. Now, this can be a little tricky with long season corns, especially like flower corns and other types that you want to dry all the way down prior to harvesting. But with sweet corn, especially some of the early and even mid season corns, I've planted as late as early July and still been able to get a harvest. But the trick with the later season plantings, at least here in my area where the rainfall drastically tapers off after the end of May, I typically when planting in June or July have to provide some supplemental irrigation to those plants plants at least to get them established. If I do not provide extra water, I can definitely tell that the plant vigor and my yields suffer because of it. Number two, Corn is a heavy feeder. Corn is definitely one of the heaviest garden feeders, in particular of nitrogen, especially later into its growth cycle. If you're able to, it's a great idea to work some good compost or aged manure into your planting area prior to planting seed. I also prefer to side dress my corn with aged cow manure when it's about six to 12 inches tall. In lieu of, or in addition to this, I sometimes also use a natural balanced fertilizer. Now at this young stage, at that about six inches tall stage, I don't overdo it on the nitrogen quite yet. I want more of a balanced fertilizer so that these plants are focusing on getting some good roots established, not putting on a bunch of lush green growth. So after the seedlings are over 12 inches tall, then I will typically go in with a higher nitrogen fertilizer. I typically use a food called Sweet Corn Alive. It is a 6-3-3 ratio, but you could definitely go higher on that depending on your individual soil conditions. Some growers opt for something like a 20-10-10. If you're really nitrogen deficient, you could even use something like ammonium sulfate, which is typically right around 21-0-0. So very, very high in nitrogen. Urea is also a high nitrogen supplement that many growers opt for. The thing to be aware of with urea is that if it is not incorporated into the soil via tillage or precipitation, it is highly susceptible to ammonia volatization. So basically, 
just escaping as gas into the atmosphere rather than getting into the soil and feeding your plants. Now, additionally, if your plants are starting to look really peaked and yellow later in the season, they may be crying out for more nitrogen at that point as well. The color of your corn foliage is really going to tell you everything you need to know. If it is lush and dark and green, those corn plants are happy. If it's kind of yellowish or sickly looking, there could be other things going on, but it's highly likely that they're craving a dose of nitrogen. Number three, planting configuration is crucial for proper pollination. To ensure proper pollination as corn is wind pollinated, planting in a block or group configuration helps to ensure that the pollen is actually reaching the silks. When you plant corn in one big long row, you might get some pollination, but it is probably not going to be complete. And what you will see are a lot of skips in your ears. So places where kernels just did not fill, that is because no pollen reached that silk and that kernel did not form. As a general rule, I like to plant out my corn plots in about a 12 by 15 block but as we will talk about a little later you can go smaller space than that number four pay attention to isolation requirements now this is one that many folks are not aware of different types of corn so sweet pop flower dent ornamental as well as different genotypes of sweet corn itself all have different isolation requirements. All sweet corn should be separated from any other type of corn. So you do not want your sweet corn grown next to popcorn or ornamental corn or flower corn or next to that farmer's giant field of field corn. In rural areas, this can be particularly tricky. So you want to really pay attention to what the farmers are planting next to you. In our area, typically they will go corn soybean every other year. So I know on soybean years I'm safe, but on corn years, I wanna make sure and either beat them to the planting or I'll wait until about three weeks after they have planted to plant my corn. Now, if you happen to have something like a woods or a tree line or something that will block you or separate you from the field next door, you're a lot safer in terms of not having cross-pollination issues. But if it's just all open like it is at my parents, you have to really be careful about that because cross-pollination between a field corn and a sweet corn is essentially going to ruin the eating quality of your sweet corn. Now, what I mean in terms of isolation is that you want to keep different types of corn separated either by at least 300 feet or by three plus weeks of maturity. Now, for more information on all of the different sweet corn genotypes, as well as detailed isolation instructions, be sure to check out the video linked above where I cover this topic in depth. Number five, clear out the competition. Corn does not appreciate weed competition. This is true for many garden crops, but corn in particular, because it is relatively shallow rooted for the size of the plants, and because it is such a nutrient and water hog, clearing out as much of the weed competition as possible will help you get better yields. Be aware though, if you are hoeing or tilling between your rows to get rid of weeds, shallow cultivation is key. This is again, because corn has relatively shallow root system, if you go too deep or too aggressively, you'll disrupt the roots of your corn. Now when hoeing, I have always gently pulled the dirt that I'm hoeing from the middle of the rows up towards the base of my corn plants essentially hilling them. This helps a little to cover those roots and to keep the corn from just flopping over in a heavy windstorm. I'm doing this very, very lightly though. You do not wanna hill that soil clear up onto the stalks of the plant because that can lead to rot. After my corn is up and growing well, I typically also try to cover the aisleways between my plantings with a natural mulch. My go-to is alfalfa hay because it's going to help to really suppress those weeds. But anything, including grass clippings or leaf mulch, even black plastic can be used between rows to help suppress weeds. Number six, water, water, water. In addition to being a heavy feeder, corn sucks up a huge amount of water, especially as it's nearing maturity. You'll get the best ear production if you can provide your corn with an inch or so of water per week, especially from the time tasseling starts until harvest. That being said, I have found corn to be an extremely resilient crop in general, and there are definitely varieties out there that have been bred to deal with very stressful growing conditions, including a lack of water. 
Usually with my May plantings, if we get a little rain while the corn is getting established, I get out there and mulch heavily, thanks in part to my clay soil, which retains moisture. I can often get away with not watering at all or maybe only watering once through the growing season. Now, my yields and ear size may suffer a little, but to me, not having to water all the time is worth that trade-off. Now, as I mentioned before, with later season plantings, I do definitely have to water. And if you are growing somewhere else where you're not getting the rain or your weather is very, very hot and dry, or you're growing on sandy soil, you're going to have to provide a lot more supplemental irrigation. Number seven, unfortunately, critters love corn. And somehow they always know when it is just about at peak ripeness. I have had this happen to myself. I've heard this from so many people. You're waiting and waiting and waiting for that corn to be peak. And you think, I'm gonna go out there and pick that tomorrow. Yeah, it's gonna be perfect. And those ornery raccoons, I swear they know it. They will get out there that night and strip your corn plot bare. So if you are growing in an area where you know you have raccoons or you have deer, take precautions to protect your corn. A lot of people opt for electric fencing. I've had decent luck with just a five foot wire fence and outdoor, <laughs> and outdoor dogs to scare the critters away. But raccoons in particular are very clever and very persistent. So just be aware of that when you are planning on planting out your corn. And it's not just animal critters. Insect pests love corn as well. And corn earworm is one of the most prevalent corn pests in the majority of the United States. Young corn earworm larvae can feed on the silks, disrupting pollination. And eventually the corn earworms will find their way from the silks down into the actual ear. Corn earworm populations are at their heaviest during the later part of the season. So one of the best ways for home growers to avoid these critters are to plant early and to plant earlier or mid-season maturity corns. It will also help to seek out varieties that have good husk coverage. Breeders are paying a lot more attention to how the husks are actually covering the ears. So they're making sure that these wrapper leaves extend a good ways past the actual tip of the ear, that they're very tight on that ear, and that there's a good thick layer of wrapper husks around that ear. All of this makes it more difficult for those earworms to get down into the ear itself. This will also help with opportunistic pests like those little black sap beetles that like to get in after the earworms have started feeding. Young larvae can also be hand-picked off of the end of the ears, and then you can wrap that husk back up and secure it with a tie or rubber band, even a clothespin to keep more larvae from entering the ear. Corn earworm, unfortunately, can be difficult to control with insecticide because they have developed resistance to many of the commonly used sprays. Organic options for control include products with the active ingredients spinosad, pyrethrin, and Bt. You can also apply plain mineral oil or horticultural oil to the silks to help smother the earworms, mixing in a little Bt or spinosad for extra effectiveness. If opting for the smothering route though, timing is very important for this as well. If you apply too early, you can disrupt pollination. If applied too late, you'll miss that window and the earworms will have already traveled into the ear and be safe from the smothering oil. Number eight, pick at the right time for the best tasting corn. For sweet corn in particular, if you pick too soon, the kernels won't have reached their optimal flavor or size. If you pick too late, the sugars will have actually started to convert to starches, ruining the eating quality and the texture of your sweet corn. I find it easiest to look at the silks to determine maturity. I want those silks to be dried down and brown. If it's still blonde in color, it's not mature yet. I also feel the ear to make sure they are filled out and plump. If you're really unsure, you can peel back just a smidge of the tip of the husk. Peeking at the kernels inside to gauge their maturity. If they're not fully mature yet, just put the husk back and you can even wrap a rubber band or tie a string around the tip of this husk to keep it well covered. And simply check back in a couple more days to see if they've reached peak maturity yet. If sweet corn is over mature, the kernels will start to get a sunken look in the middle. This indicates that the sugars have already started converting to starch. But these are at peak. 
so let's take a look. Now, <laughs> most sweet corn is not gonna look like this. This is a new variety that I am trialing, but this is what you're going to look for. You want these kernels totally filled out and plump all the way to the tip. No sign of any indentations yet. If I press a fingernail into those kernels, they're milky, still juicy. That is a perfectly mature ear of corn. But the really important thing, yeah, that's good corn. Now for other types of corn, popcorn, flower corn, dent corn, ornamental corn, you're going to leave those ears on the plants until they have dried down. I typically harvest these types of corn in October before that frost hits. But what you're looking for there are for those kernels to be totally hard to where you cannot pierce that kernel with your fingernail. If they're not all the way dried down before the frost hits, or if you live in a particularly humid climate or you've been receiving a lot of rain, you can harvest them, put them in a dry, warm location, and let them dry down that way. I prefer to lay them single layer on a drying rack in some place like a warm, dry barn. You can use a porch, even your living room, just basically any spot that they're going to be protected from receiving additional moisture. I let them dry for a couple of weeks before moving them to their permanent storage. And number nine, you can grow corn in small spaces, even containers. So for folks that don't have the room or the desire to work up a bunch of ground to plant corn, small space is an option. I like to use 20 gallon grow tubs and I will grow six plants of corn per tub, usually grouping them together with two or three tubs. Again, this is just going to help to ensure that proper pollination is happening. You can do something similar in a small raised bed or even a tiny corner of the garden. You're not going to get a huge yield this way, but you can get a few tasty fresh ears for eating or a few ears of popcorn or ornamental corn this way. Now, whether you're growing in a container or a raised bed, all of those basics are going to be the same. You want to provide that corn with some nutrient rich soil. So choose a good potting mix, maybe work in some manure and definitely feed them. But for more detail on how I grow my container corn, check out the video linked above. And like I mentioned before, variety selection can be key here as well. There is new breeding being done, in particular for sweet corn, that is more compact and better suited to containers. You can certainly grow great big tall varieties in a container, but be aware that they're definitely at a higher risk of being blown over by summer storms. So those are my main lessons learned in the quest for great corn. What would you add to this list? Drop a line in the comments below and let me know. And if you enjoyed today's video, please consider subscribing to my channel, Growfully with Jenna. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Do you know the twist trick? Yeah. You just watch. You go snap, twist. Snap, twist. Snap, twist. I can get more than this. doesn't want to come off of there. Snap twist. Yo, look how big this one is, Mama.